Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopez as always and today I'm joined by Mr. David Pierce. He is a prominent figure within the transhumanist movement and one of the co-founders of Humanity Plus. He has self-published an internet manifesto titled The Hedonistic Imperative, where he outlines how pharmacology, genetic engineering, nanotechnology and neurosurgery could converge to eliminate all forms of unpleasant experience from human and non-human life, replacing suffering with what he calls gradients of bliss. And he calls this the abolitionist project. And these are the kinds of, of things we're going to talk about today. So, Mr. Pierce, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Hello, Ricardo. It's great to be with you. <laughs> okay, so uh, perhaps let's start with uh, some concepts. Uh, I know that you take a, what you call a lexical negative utilitarianist approach. <laughs> so, could you explain <laughs> that? Well, I've never actually used the term lexical negative utilitarian. Uh, Wikipedia calls, calls me this. But yes, essentially, I'm personally a negative utilitarian. I think our overriding ethical obligation is to minimize and prevent suffering and ultimately abolish suffering throughout the living world. Um, that's creating pleasure, bliss, happiness, it's wonderful, but it must never be done at the expense of, of anyone else. And the intuition behind negative utilitarianism is captured by a wonderful little short story by Ursula Le Guin, uh, The Ones Who Walk Away From Omelas. Uh, in Le Guin's fable, uh, the city of Omelas is an immense city of fabulous delights. Everyone has an absolutely wonderful time. And yet, for unexplained reasons, the city of Omelas depends for its existence on the torment of a child in, locked away in the basement. And the citizens of Omelas are aware of this, but in some sense, most of them, they think it's a price worth paying for their wonderful existence. But there are a small number of people who who walk away from Omelas, uh, who, who think that no amount of pleasure and joy, even, uh, even immense happiness, is worth the abuse of a single child. And yeah, essentially negative utilitarians share this intuition that I promise I love happiness and joy as much as, 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 as anyone, but I'm not a classical utilitarian. I don't see a straightforward uh, symmetry. And so, although I advocate and tentatively predict a future of life based on gradients of intelligent bliss, it's vital this doesn't come at anyone's expense. Yeah. And, I mean, do you adopt any specific form of hedonism? I mean, I'm not sure if there are different forms of hedonism or not, but what, how would you define your thing? <laughs> Yes, I mean, the original title of this, of my manifesto I wrote back in 1995, The Hedonistic Imperative, uh, this sounds very debauched, and it's not technically false, in that I do advocate and predict uh, a future world based entirely on gradients of superhuman bliss, but it's not hedonism in the sense, the popular sense of something that is shallow or amoral or one-dimensional. So it's, it's not uh, advocating a life of drink, drugs and debauchery. Uh, ethical hedonism should also be distinguished from so-called psychological hedonism. Psychological hedonism is the theory that all we do is ultimately uh, animated by the desire for pleasure and, uh, and the shunning of pain. Now, there is at least, well, there is more than a grain of truth in psychological hedonism, but that isn't the kind of hedonism we're talking about here. Um, I would have liked to have titled the original manifesto something like the ethical obligation to minimize suffering via, via biotechnology and create life based on gradients of bliss, but that would be much more of a mouthful. So in the end, I perhaps sacrificed my moral seriousness of purpose for the sake of a sappy title. <laughs> 
<laughs> so you've already used this term gradients of list several times. What do they? What does this refer to exactly? Yes, the gradients is. Is, is, is important because in order to preserve critical insight, social responsibility, personal development, it's vital to be sensitive and responsive to good and bad stimuli. Uh, and uh, if today our hedonic range is crudely, let's say, between minus 10 and zero and plus 10, it will be possible in future to create a hedonic range of, let's say, plus 5 to plus 50, or plus 30 to plus 50, or even plus 90 to plus 100. But if we are to preserve complex civilization, values, uh, anything, all of, all of our kind of traditional conceptions of what makes for civilization, then it will be vital to preserve uh, responsiveness to good and bad stimuli, uh, both in terms of noxious stimuli, in terms of things that are physically damaging, but also in the more cerebral sense too. Um, the bliss is 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 more is more uh, explanatory. I mean, think of today's. Uh, peak experiences, mastery of our reward circuitry promises a world in which the worst parts of transhuman, posthuman life are richer than today's peak experiences. But we're not talking about uniform bliss. Uh, it's information sensitive gradients of bliss, recalibrating the hedonic treadmill. And this is a bit of jargon, the hedonic treadmill, but it's still it's still rather useful. The hedonic treadmill is the set of negative feedback mechanisms in the central nervous system that stops most of us today being very happy or very sad for long. And each of us has this kind of approximate hedonic set point, this kind of default. Uh, some people are lucky and have quite a high hedonic default. Other people tragically have a low hedonic default but yeah, we tend to fluctuate in the course of a lifetime around this default. And the idea of recalibrating the hedonic treadmill uh, is to ensure that everyone has uh, an extremely high hedonic set point. Mm -hmm. But would your goal be to eliminate suffering completely or simply to reduce it as much as possible without eliminating it completely? I think the first stage is clearly going to be ethically to get rid of the worst forms of suffering. And this will take a, a number of uh, forms. Some are technically straightforward. For example, we need to get factory farms and slaughterhouses shut and outlawed. And your pig, for example, is as sentient and demonstrably as, as, as sapient as a, as, as a toddler. And essentially, we shouldn't be harming non-humans. But other forms of intervention are, are much more high tech. Uh, for example, if we are to get rid of uh, suffering, we're going to need to offer all prospective parents worldwide access to pre-implantation, genetic screening, counseling, and soon uh, genome editing. And it's going to be essentially po possible to choose the default settings both to for pain sensitivity, uh, but also hedonic range and hedonic set points. And before getting rid of all kinds of suffering, it makes sense to, for example, ensure that your any future child has an extremely high pain threshold, an extremely high hed hedonic set point. Um, if you look today at, let's say, just thinking of physical pain, uh, today's genetic outliers who, who still respond adaptively to noxious stimuli, but they'll say such things as, ah, pain is just a useful signaling mechanism. Um, before thinking of literally getting rid of all experience below hedonic zero, yeah, we want to make sure that everyone has, yeah, a kind of, a kind of hedonic default, such as is today enjoyed only by uh, extreme genetic outliers. Um, how will we literally get rid of all experience below hedonic zero? Well, we can 
chat about uh, this later. Um, one option is some form of cyborgization. The other is information sensitive gradients of bliss, but creating an architecture of mind based entirely on gradients of well being poses many challenges. Mm -hmm. But how, how would we go about recalibrating uh, pain sensitivity and pain thresholds? Would we perhaps do it on the basis of uh, the sort of genetic outliers, or how would we go about it exactly? Yes, I mean, although hundreds of different genes are involved in pain press processing, there is one critical gene, the SCN9A gene, the so-called volume knob for pain and it's got dozens of different alleles. Now, nonsense mutations of SCN9A abolish pain, but they also abolish the capacity for nociception too. And, this, and, the, and it's, it's, it's vital to preserve nociception. But what we can do is ensure that all future children, and so this, is a, this involves epigenetic editing, existing people but let's focus on existing or on future uh, uh, people for now if we choose a benign allele of the scn9a gene it is be possible to ensure that all future children have extremely high pain thresholds uh and uh yeah and so we can get rid of, of, of the worst forms of, of, of physical suffering by a, a, a simple genetic tweak like that. Um, in the case of mental suffering, a higher hedonic set point, there is no master volume switch for hedonic tone, but already molecular biologists, geneticists are teasing out the mechanisms involved, and it's going to be possible to load the genetic dice in favor of our future children. Um, I think uh, uh, probably quite a lot of people uh, listening will be, will be thinking, well, is this kind of experimentation justified? But all forms of sexual reproduction involve experimentation. If, if you think it is ethically permissible to bring life and suffering into the world, you are conducting a genetic experiment, unique and untested. Uh, and if you do engage in such uh, such experimentation, I think you have an obligation to try to load the genetic dice in favor of your future children, which is now possible. Mm -hmm. But how can we be sure that a particular pain threshold is good enough for pain to be protective? Because if we, I would imagine that if we elevate pain thresholds too much, then people would be subject to certain kinds of harm. Yes, I mean, this is what, this is, uh, I mean, I said I shouldn't gloss over the potential pitfalls, the, the need to be well-controlled studies of finding out uh, what are the potential pitfalls, expect, because pe people who have extremely high pain thresholds, who or, or are temperamentally extremely cheerful, are they, for example, more likely to take risks? Um, uh, in certain circumstances, yes. However, paradoxically, or perhaps not so paradoxically, the happiest people, the people who love life most, actually often tend to live longer than depressives, prone to self-neglect. Self so it, 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 it's, it's not straightforward. Um, and in practice, the, yeah, there will be tragedies and missteps at the moment i don't know what the figure is in portugal but something like one in seven kids ends up in casualty each year generally with something not too uh, not too not too serious um if you do modulate pain thresholds yes the, this will this will shift behavior in all kinds of, of subtle ways too but um yeah, I mean, if, if you're comfortable now, uh, physically comfortable, not in pain, pain probably doesn't sound uh, so bad. But nonetheless, hundreds of millions of people worldwide suffer terrible, uh, uh, terrible pain. And this is now going to be essentially an uh, adjustable uh, parameter. Now, yeah, I, this is it. 
all sorts of potential things can go wrong, which is why we uh, need a debate. But uh, yeah, given given that uh, most people are not anti-natalists, most people do think they're entitled to bring more life into the world, they also need to consider how much suffering do they want to create. Mm -hmm. And what forms of life do you consider objects of your ethical system? Is it all sentient beings or just some kinds of animals or what exactly? Yes, uh, essentially all sentient beings. Uh, uh, now, the precise margins of sentience are controversial. Um, But I think there's a whole bunch of evidence that, uh, for example, worms are sentient. They have uh, uh, an opioid and dopamine system. They have the same basic uh, genetic pathways uh, as humans do. Uh, and this is the extraordinary thing about uh, technology, essentially that the whole biosphere is now programmable. And though I think we uh, should focus on humans and higher vertebrates, nonetheless, even the humblest life forms uh, can be helped. Now, you might intuitively think, well, how on earth can we possibly help small invertebrates in marine ecosystems or rodents or Amazonia or something like that? But yeah, CRISPR-based synthetic gene drives, sorry, that's a bit of jargon, gene drives essentially cheat the laws of Mendelian inheritance and enable uh, scientists in principle to, to push through benign, if they want to, benign genes across entire populations, even at a fitness cost to the individual. Gene drives are probably first going to be used to defeat, let's say, malaria and other forms of infectable disease in Africa. If you can ensure that uh, uh, all the offspring of uh, Nopheles mosquito or male, you can induce that, uh, a population crash. Um, but as well as stuff like that, it's also possible to push, uh, let's say, low pain genes across entire populations of sexually reproducing species. And so, yeah, this is the, this is the shall we say, the, the, uh, the uh, looking rather ahead uh, from the immediate stuff. But uh, yeah, essentially, If we decide we want to minimize and eventually abolish suffering in the rest of the living world, it would be possible to do so with biotech too. Mm -hmm. But with this goal in mind of abolishing suffering in the sentient world, let's say, Uh, I think we have a problem in the animal king kingdom specifically because since we have predators and animals that consume other animals, how would we deal with those kinds of animals? I mean, would we have to lead them to extinction or what? Uh, is my personal view and what I actually advocate. Uh, personally, I think uh, a world of human and non-human predators, I don't see any ethical need to try to conserve recognizable approximations of existing predators. But this is not what I advocate. Most people are aghast at the idea of a world without lions and tigers. Uh, most people identify more with the magnificent king of the beasts than they do with a zebra being terrorized and slowly asphyxiated. You know, it's, it's absolutely ghastly, kind of asphyxiation, as anyone who's been waterboarded will, will attest. But yeah, with uh, genetic engineering, it's going to be possible to tweak uh, existing predators so they don't harm uh, their victims. Stop gaps are possible. For example, one could use Uh, catnip flavored cultured uh, mince meat uh, and essentially use instead of predation and starvation it would be possible to use fertility regulation via cross species fertility regulation tunable gene drives and the like uh, to essentially veganize the whole biosphere and this is the peaceable kingdom of Isaiah if you recall from Uh, the book of Isaiah and the, the Bible prophesies a world where the, the lion and the wolf will lie down with the lamb. 
yeah, the Bible doesn't tell us, tell us about the technical details, but uh, yeah, we can. We're now in a position to sketch them out. In that, if if we do want to preserve recognizable approximations of so-called charismatic megafauna, it's going to be possible. A critic will say, well, a lion that isn't eating zebras is no longer truly a, li a lion. This is kind of species essentialism. But I would respond that, well, do humans who start wearing clothes stop bashing each over the head or go vegan cease to be truly human? Uh, and if we do, does it really matter? But yeah, essentially, we should be civilizing uh, 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 the biosphere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we would basically go about genetically engineering these species and perhaps applying other sorts of technology for them to be able to consume food sources that do not come from other animals. Is that it? Yes, I mean, it's the, this, the, the longer term view and the more short term view. Stock gaps are, you know, as, as I said, something like uh, a culture of meat. Now, there is, we are on the brink probably of a culture of meat uh, revolution for humans. Uh, and though I would strenuously urge uh, everyone to go vegan now, in practice, what is going to bring about this moral revolution in our treatment of non-human animals is going to be cultured meat and animal products. Uh, it's, and this cultured meat revolution turned into, let's say, members of the, of, of, of the cat family too, um, particularly if one is prepared to use such, <laughs> such things as uh, uh, catnip and so on. Um, essentially, every cubic meter of the planet is shortly going to be accessible to surveillance, micromanagement and control. And this conjures up dystopian Orwellian scenarios of some kind of global panopticon. But it will also be possible in the sense to yeah, choose how much suffering we want to exist in every cubic meter of the uh, uh, of the planet and uh, yeah ethically i hope that yeah we will assume uh essentially this is going to be compassionate conservation uh stewardship of uh, the biosphere to ensure that all sentient beings can flourish without being physically molested that all sentient beings in a sense there isn't an uncontrolled population explosion leading to Malthusian catastrophe as 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 as, as happens at the moment yeah mm -hmm. so in your manifesto you talk about different uh, technological approaches to abolish suffering, like, for example, pharmacology, genetic engineering, nanotechnology, neurosurgery. Let's talk about each of them just for people to get a clear picture of what we're talking about here. So starting with pharmacology, what are the kinds of uh, drugs that we use, we would use? Um, something like, for example, uh, one of the reasons developing effective mood brightness antidepressants is so difficult is that the neurotransmitter system most involved in hedonic tone is the opioid system. Um, and opioid drugs, as we know, have countless pitfalls of tolerance, dependence, making people asocial. Um, but it will be possible, uh, for example, to block the ACKR3 receptor. The ACKR3 receptor in the brain seems to modulate levels of endogenous opioids in the central nervous system. But by, by blocking that receptor with an orally active drug, ideally it would be possible to raise people's default hedonic tone. Now, there are other things one can do too. One might co-administer uh, let's say a selective kappa opioid antagonist. Kappa is the nasty opioid receptor. But none of this is very satisfactory because uh, this is assuming that we are treating people's existing uh, dysfunction of sort of malaise, low mood, and so forth. And I think it would be far better if we can create 
happy people. But nonetheless, a lot of people listening will be thinking, yes, well, genetic engineering, maybe our uh, children or at least our grandchildren or great grandchildren that might enjoy life based on gradients of bliss. What can we expect in our lifetime? And yeah, designer drugs will be developed that will raise hedonic tone. Most urgently, of course, for people who are depressed, but also for people who are nominally well. Um, and pitfalls, where does one start? Uh, yeah, there are all kinds of, of, of risk. And I mentioned the the role of the ACKR3 receptor uh, in the central nervous system. Uh, this, is, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is pretty new research. Uh, credit to the Luxembourg Institute of, uh, of, of Health who actually elucidated the, this, the dual function role of this uh, receptor. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a question of timescales. Are we thinking about five to 10 years, the next 50 years, or the next 500 years. And yeah, I think we do need to have this overarching ethical goal as a society to minimize, prevent, ultimately abolish suffering. But yeah, uh, it's of course incredibly grandiose speaking in terms of let's abolish suffering. Uh, all kinds of piecemeal interventions will be needed in the meantime. Mm -hmm. And in terms of genetic engineering, are there already specific genes we have identified which we could target? Yes. I mean, I, I mentioned the SCN9A gene, but there's also, let's say, the COMT gene, catecholomethyltransferase, uh, which has one version associated with a high, another a low hedonic set point. There's the very interesting case in the media uh, publicized a couple of years ago of Joe Cameron, who uh, has an unusual mutation of both her far and far out gene. Uh, Joe Cameron is a 73 year old retired Scottish school teacher. She's responsible, vegan. Uh, she's never anxious or depressed. Um, the far and far out genes uh, regulate levels of anandamide uh, in the central nervous system. Anandamide from the, uh, the Sanskrit word meaning bliss. It's essentially it's an endogenous cannabinoid. Um, in spite the name, anandamide isn't itself the bliss molecule. What's critical is its uh, interaction with the opioid system. Um, but here we see someone who is extremely high functioning, socially responsible, charming, and so forth, and yet doesn't experience uh, uh, the kind of uh, pain, uh, depression, anxiety that, for evolutionary reasons, the rest of us do. In some ways, she's not an ideal case study because she came to the attention of her doctors and then the media uh, because she has an extraordinarily high pain threshold, dis dysfunctionally so. She described childbirth, for example, as, as, as like a, a tickle and she's prone to uh, yeah, burning herself uh, uh, on the hot stove and stuff like that. Um, and it's by no means clear that, for example, um, a typical male or, you know, a young boy with her mutation or someone who didn't live in the genteel uh, Scottish Highlands or something she, uh, would, would encounter many more uh, problems. But, uh, yeah, essentially, there are genes that are being identified with multiple alleles and it would be possible if we are prepared to use pre-implantation, genetic screening, counseling, and soon gene editing to load the dice. But as in any form of genetic gambling, uh, there are risks. Uh, but you can't opt out if, if, if you intend to have kids. I mean, antinatalists would say uh, that, yeah, that bringing new life and suffering into existence without the prior consent of the victim is unjustified. 
but the future belongs to life lovers, not, not anti-natalists. And so, yeah, I think the most realistic thing we can do is urge prospective parents to gamble more responsibly. And at the moment, it's just a complete genetic patch. You know, two people uh, make love, and then this unique, untested experiment pops out nine months uh, later. And yeah, it's, it's a genetic casino. Mm -hmm. But this genetic engineering, would it also target germline cells? And I mean, because if it did so, then it would eventually uh, spread throughout the entire species, right? Yes. I mean, this, uh, this is one of, this could be an advantage. Uh, critics would say it's a disadvantage. We are doing something apparently irrevocable if one targets the, the germline. It's not irrevocable. I mean, what, what can be done can be uh, undone, but intuitively, at any rate, it is more radical targeting the germline than altering the genes of existing people. Now, unfortunately, the first CRISPR babies were created uh, a couple of years ago in China in less than ideal circumstances. You may recall that the scientist in question Allegedly, he was uh, creating babies that would enjoy uh, protection from HIV. However, the genetic mutation in question in so-called animal models tends to increase memory and cognitive performance. And rather than being naive and this just being an accidental byproduct, the science, the Chinese, the rogue scientist, Chinese scientist in question was almost certainly trying to create smart designer babies. Now, most certainly it is going to be possible to create designer babies predisposed uh, to higher cognitive performance on, on some measures, but I think the most morally urgent priority is minimizing suffering. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I mean, doesn't minimizing suffering, wouldn't it also include uh, modifying other aspects, like, for example, certain psychological traits, uh, for example, higher intelligence seems to be associated or correlated with uh, good life outcomes. So would, would your project include also modifying uh, psychological traits that would correlate with uh, with higher life satisfaction? I think there are all kinds of challenges here. It is orders of magnitude harder enriching intelligence than it is boosting mood and reducing pain. And this is because intelligence is multifactorial. There is a risk that uh, prospective parents essentially will want to boost the IQ of their future kids. And IQ tests measure only one particular kind of intelligence. They are mind blind. They measure only the autistic component of general intelligence. And any attempt, let's say a, a state sponsored attempt to try to create a high IQ super babies would also create uh, children who are much higher on the autistic uh, uh, dimension of the spectrum than, than exists today. Now, I'm not here making a judgment uh, as to what level of autistic intelligence is, is desirable, but there is a risk if one has a very impoverished conception of what intelligence amounts to, uh, that instead of creating children who are genetically predisposed to be empathetic, high in social cognition, cooperative problem solving, are instead, uh, let's say, Asperger's. Now, the contribution of people with uh, Asperger's to civilization has been immense, but nonetheless creating a whole society of Asperger's or super Asperger's Goodness knows, yeah, there needs to be a serious ethical debate here.
Uhum. And when it comes specifically to nanotechnology, are there specific kinds of nanotechnology you consider? Um, I originally, but this is back in 1995, I invoked Eric Drexler in the engines of creation nanotechnology because I couldn't see how else to spread the abolitionist project to the rest of the living world that you know one can imagine kind of welfare state for, for elephants large free living terrestrial invertebrates but how could one help marine ecosystems although i do foresee a future of self-replicating nanobots patrolling the oceans and so on uh yeah back in 1995 clearly i hadn't anticipated uh the potential of of, of, of gene drives, synthetic gene drives that will essentially allow remote control of ecosystems. Um, so, yeah, sorry if that's uh, uh, a bit uh, hand wavy. Uh, self replicating nanobots uh, are, are, are coming, but the precise form they will take, what kind of time scale, and their role is still very much up in the air. Mm-hmm. And about neurosurgery, would you still include that in your project as a possible solution? Yeah. Um, <laughs> the crudest way to get rid of suffering is so-called wireheading or intracranial self-stimulation, what used to be called uh, direct stimulation of the pleasure centers. So this is a bit of a misnomer. Uh, and I think wireheading should today be offered as an option for victims of intractable pain or chronic depression who aren't helped by existing therapies. But it's it's a last resort. It, it's not information sensitive gradients of bliss or anything refined like that. And wireheading is not a global solution to the problem of suffering. I mean, for a start, wireheads don't want to have baby wireheads. Uh, essentially, someone who is doing nothing but either manually or being done automatically for them, having their reward centers stimulated is not participating as a member of society. I think it, it's very much a last resort. And in any case, the only people who find the idea of wireheading and cranial self-stimulating, self-stimulation attractive tends to be severe uh, depressives. But it's important to note this option, if only on grounds of technical completeness. Um, mm -hmm. But to reach your goals, is the, are these kinds of technologies already available, sufficiently well developed, or are they still in the future? It would be possible with existing technologies to have a hundred year plan to eliminate suffering. And I think most realistically, this would happen not under the guise of something like the hedonistic imperative, but rather the World Health Organization definition of health in its founding constitution, the World Health Organization defines health. Health is a state of complete physical, social, emotional uh, well-being. And this could only be achieved via something like uh, genetic uh, 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 engineering. Um, in terms of the technologies involved, cultured meat, uh, uh, essentially it's possible uh, now. Uh, it needs to be, uh, yeah, it needs to be further developed and commercialized, but uh, in the case of cultured meat, we're not talking about genetically engineered meat. It could be, cultured meat could be genetically engineered to enhance flavor, texture, nutritional properties, but it's far better to stress that cultured meat is natural. And this will enable us to get the death factories shut and outlawed. Um, the, uh, yeah, pre-implantation genetic screening and counseling, it's not really feasible now, it's done. It's most commonly done not in uh, the West, as one might imagine, but most commonly in India and China, sadly for the purposes of gender selection. But it would be possible to do that, uh, to pre-select pain thresholds, hedonic tone and, and, and the like. Uh, 
CRISPR, gene editing, yes, it's already been done. We touched on this, not in ideal circumstances, but the need to be well-controlled uh, well trial, uh, trials. Um, something like synthetic gene drives to be used in nature to minimize and prevent suffering before doing trials in, in, in the wild, self-contained artificial biospheres will be desirable. So one would essentially create uh, a, a miniature biosphere with extremely uh, happy, no pain uh, organisms. And yeah, you know, what can go wrong? There needs to be, yeah, uh, proper, proper well-controlled trials before, uh, yeah, uh, these drives are unleashed in the wild. Mm -hmm. Could we becoming cyborgs also be part of a solution or a possible solution? Yes, but one, I think one needs to uh, define what one means by cyborg. I mean, there are some some scenarios like uh, sort of, sort of like Ray Kurzweil has outlined in which any distinction between humans and our machines is obliterated and you get scenarios such as mind uploading this is the in my opinion fanciful idea that you could be digitally uh, scanned and uploaded to a different less perishable medium and could live perpetually uh, uh, in cyberspace but there are other forms of cyborgization that are more plausible we're seeing uh, Elon Musk's Neuralink. Now, there's a lot of hype there, and we've got a long way to go. But essentially, it's going to be possible in a neurochip uh, for with with the right implant for you and anyone else to be able to do all the things that a classical digital computer, programmable digital computer, can do and more. And this can range uh, possible scenarios, everything from, for example, smart neuros prostheses. If we want to get rid of pain altogether, you could have an implant or implant such that your hand withdraws from, let's say, the hot stove before you experience any kind of uh, distress or noxious stimulus. Presumably, one would want these. Neuroprostheses to have a manual override so you didn't feel you'd lost control of your body, but as well as the physical stuff would be possible essentially, yeah, for you to uh, be a, a full spectrum super intelligence who has not merely narrow super intelligence on a neurochip, but of course also conscious, uh, uh, conscious experience in the way that uh, organic robots do too. So, yeah, cyborgization is coming. It's uh, an ugly, uh, it's an ugly word. But, yeah, one needs to distinguish scenarios in which humans, transhumans, posthumans are enhanced by digital technology and those in which, in some sense, we, we merge or, or are even replaced by it. Uh, I mean, I'm in, in one sense, I'm very conservative. I think our successors will also be a biological descendant, but there are futurists, some transhumanists who, uh, yeah, who believe that humans are actually going to be replaced. Mm -hmm. Do you think that uh, through cyborgization we would ever be possible to become cyborgs that we would no longer need to feel pain to avoid the kinds of harms pain protects us from and completely eliminating pain? Yes, it's, I gave the example of a neuroprosthesis that says you automatically uh, withdraw your uh, hands. Yeah, it would be possible to offload the entire function of nociception onto neuroprostheses, i.e. to have a, a different signaling system from the, from the existing pleasure pain axis. Now, such a scenario uh, could... Uh, it's it's not inconsistent with the idea of creating life based entirely on gradients of, of bliss. You could combine some degree of cyborgization with radical hedonic uplift. Yeah, it's 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 a scenario to explore. Only, of course, many people, bioconservatives, don't like the idea of becoming cyborgs. 
uh, in which case one would uh, aim for a, a biological intervention. Mm -hmm. would, you, would you be open to ideas like, for example, Robert Nozick's experience machine where we would basically plug people into a machine where they would be fed with pleasant experiences? Personally, yes. I, if I felt that I could no longer do any useful good in this world, I would plug into a notional uh, experience machine. But one of the beauties of hedonic recalibration is that it enables uh, everyone to participate in what passes as, as, as the real world, but nonetheless their default quality of life is massively enhanced. So you can get the degree of realism. It's, it's not escapism. If, if your uh, hedonic range and hedonic set point were recalibrated and you woke up in the morning in extremely good mood, you could still preserve your existing core values and pursue uh, yeah, your, your life projects. Um, but uh, yeah, it wouldn't involve yeah, the, the, the total escapism of an experience machine. Um, yeah, also one has to consider the wider implications. Is it possible that the future does lie in experience machines, which could, you know, have completely different laws of physics? Any scenario you like, you could be emperor of the, the galaxy, Casanova of the cosmos, any, anything you want. But I think ultimately power resides in basement reality. And if you spend your life entirely in an experience machine. You won't want to have children in basement reality, the physical world. And so there is going to be selection pressure against any predisposition to spend one's life in experience machines, just as there will be selection pressure uh, in, uh, against any predisposition to wirehead, to plug, plug uh, uh, to plug electrodes into one's uh, pleasure centers, so to speak. So, uh, although experience machine, it's a nice uh, thought experiment. Immersive VR, it's coming. If you've tried an Oculus Quest and so on, it's it's absolutely amazing. It's just a foretaste. Nonetheless, uh, these are simply <clears throat> options for the future, and we one needs to consider the nature of of, of selection pressure and someone who who wants to, to live in basement reality with their basement uh, children uh, and, uh, yeah, essentially not uh, go off into an escapist fantasy world, that is going to be feasible too. We don't need to choose between uh, the red pill and the blue pill, so to speak. Do you think we should also strive for immortality to try to eliminate the kinds of suffering and anxiety that come from being faced with death? Yes, um, the transhumanist uh, movement, uh, the, the, kind of the, the three supers of transhumanism, super intelligence, super longevity and super happiness. And my focus has been on super happiness. But uh, yeah, transhumanists also believe in defeating the biology of aging, radical life extension. This is particularly the work of Aubrey de Grey, ending aging uh, has been seminal here. Now, unlike technologies to control mood, motivation and hedonic tone, we don't yet know how to defeat aging uh, and uh, I think a lot of people find it distressing. You know, you can say that, yeah, next century and beyond, humans, transhumans won't uh, grow old and die, but uh, you will. However, that's one reason if the thought of growing old and dying and not being able to experience these wondrous delights in the future upsets you, this is one reason to sign up for cryonics and maybe soon even uh, uh, cryothanasia. Uh, because if you are suspended in optimal conditions, then so long as there is no irretrievable information loss, then it 
it will probably be possible for you to be reanimated at some uh, some future date. Um, so yes, I, I I think we should be aiming as a society for a triple S civilization of super intelligence, super longevity, and super happiness. It's not going to happen. Well, barring unimaginable uh, revolutions, it's not going to happen. Uh, this century, but I think this should be uh, our goal as, as, as a society. Mm -hmm. Do you also consider any social or political reforms that could possibly contribute to abolishing suffering, or do you simply focus on these sorts of transhumanist technological advancement? There are... <clears throat> a long, long list of social, political, economic reforms I would like to see. Uh, you know, stuff like, you know, kind of guaranteed access uh, to health care, uh, guaranteed access to, uh, to housing, guaranteed universal basic income, and a long shopping list of social and political reforms. Um, so why don't I talk more about them, partly because other people have done it better, but partly too, because even if we do, uh, if, if all the social reforms that you can think of are implemented, the hedonic treadmill will still grind. I, the, the, you know, this, the, the set of negative feedback mechanisms in the central nervous system. And sadly, in spite of decades, centuries of reforms, there is no evidence that on average, people's default hedonic tone is higher now than it was, let's say, in the, in the Stone Ages and the, the African savanna. Now, this is not in any way to downplay the importance of social reform, justice, uh, improved rights for women, gay people, bi people, transsexual. I mean, I, I promise I'm as committed as, as anyone to, uh, to political and social reform. But yeah, we need a biohappiness revolution too, because otherwise, even in an ideal society, and goodness knows how, uh, how far we are away from a, an ideal society at the moment, there will, given our, bi our biological genetic makeup, there will still be terrible suffering in the absence of reward pathway enhancement uh, unless we are prepared to tackle our corrupt genetic source code. Mm -hmm. and, but apart from changing ourselves, do you think that we should also change our environments in specific ways for the kinds of mechanisms that we've evolved to that produce suffering but were adaptive during our evolutionary history to become obsolete? Yes, uh, essentially consider each of our core emotions. We need to understand why it evolved, what particular role this emotion had in the ancestral environment of adaptation and ask, do we want to preserve the role and do we want to preserve the raw fields? And something like jealousy, for example, uh, do we want to Jealousy, it's genetically adaptive. Do we want to preserve this role? And do we want to preserve the corrosive raw fields of, of jealousy? In the case of jealousy, I would hope that eventually it can be phased out altogether, both the raw fields and the functional role. But other uh, emotions, something like anxiety, we clearly need to preserve the functional role of anxiety even if we want to mitigate and eventually abolish the nasty raw fields of worry and neurosis. I it's worth perhaps considering low mood uh, uh, depression. Um, why do we live in a world in which hundreds of millions of people are depressed and hundreds of millions of more suffer from subclinical depression, various other forms of low mood or simply just feeling a bit blah. It seems that the evolutionary purpose of depression 
it's the kind of, it's been called the internalized correlate of the losing subroutine. Low mood is associated with subordination, defeat, keeping one's head down, and that if non non social animals don't seem to get depressed, they suffer in other ways, but they don't uh, suffer depression. And it, depression seems to be an adaptation to group group living. That in the ancestral environment, if you're a, a rather weak, weedy, uh, 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 delta minus male, to be very crude about it, if you challenge the dominant alpha, you could be badly mauled, maybe expelled from the troop, which would be lethal, uh, uh, lethal for a vulnerable social primate. And uh, essentially, depression, though it seems utterly maladaptive from a gene's eye perspective. Keeping one's head down, behavioural suppression, the spectrum of behaviour associated with, with with low mood, it was genetically adaptive in many circumstances in the ancestral environment. Whereas having an extremely a predisposition to a high mood, it's a kind of high risk, high reward. You know, you might you know do daring, adventurous things, which gives more reproductive opportunities. You may become the dominant alpha in the tribe. But yeah, of course, you can come to a, a sticky end. So yeah, uh, by raising uh, essentially default tonic tone, so we all become hypothymics, this would probably change the dynamics of society too. One of the arguments against uh, making everyone happier is, is the kind of the brave new world Huxley scenario. But whereas Huxley and others conceived happiness, engineered happiness, Soma and the like, as a tool for the dominant elites to keep the uh, to keep the populace uh, in check, in practice, it's the opposite syndrome that is is more likely that happy people are more likely to be active citizens, less willing uh, to be bossed around. A world in which everyone is hypothymic. Hypothymic is just the fancy term for having a high hedonic set point, being temperamentally very cheerful. A hypothymic civilization, uh, yeah, as, uh, the, the dynamics of society would, would, would change. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are people that when they're faced with these sorts of uh, human enhancement we've been talking about through genetic engineering, nanotechnology, pharmacology, and so on, uh, they worry that possibly we would no longer be human, whatever that means. Do you think that people should worry about it? Uh, candidly, no. Um, whether one uses the language of uh, enhancement or remediation, and they have different overtones, uh, I think many people, probably most people, are comfortable with the idea of curing well-known genetic diseases, but the idea of some kind of global hedonic uplift by genetic engineering, this counts as enhancement. And yet, back to the World Health Organization and its its definition of, of, of health. In one sense, what I'm what John Chimnus, uh, 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 advocating life based on information-sensitive gradients of well-being, gradients of bliss, is less ambitious than the World Health Organization definition of health, complete uh, 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 physical, emotional, social, social well, well-being. Um, and I think transhumans and posthumans, looking back, rather than seeing what is being advocated now by transhumanists as, as enhancement, will see it as remediation. One has a desperately impoverished conception of mental and physical health if one sees these interventions as enhancements. They're really, yeah, just <laughs> ways uh, to, to remedy the uh, appalling uh, deficits of evolution because evolution didn't design us to be happy. Evolution designed us to be discontented a lot of the time because uh, discontent helps us leave more copies of our genes. Uh, 
Whereas, uh, yeah, to, to to create a kind of civilization that even remotely approximates good health as defined by the World Health Organization, we need biological genetic interventions uh, by having this revolution. Mm -hmm. But do you think that the sorts of modifications that we would apply to humans would fundamentally change our conscious experience? Yes, but one needs to, uh, to, to, to clarify what one means here. Simply having much, much higher default hedonic tone. This isn't, this isn't psychedelia. I mean, uh, even the uh, dying in the world bioconservative would enjoy the idea, I would imagine, of waking up tomorrow morning in an extremely good mood. So, yeah, in that sense, it's consciousness altering but not in uh, a sense of, of, of psychedelia. Now, in practice, I suspect that transhumans and posthumans will be exploring radically altered state spaces of consciousness, and they will do so safely, because once we have eliminated the physical possibility of experience below hedonic zero, then altered state spaces of consciousness can safely be explored uh, and yeah I don't know the nature of the state spaces of consciousness that transhumans and posthumans will enjoy but one shouldn't imagine that by uh, embracing the biohappiness revolution one is buying into any kind of anything trippy or exotic like that uh, instead hedonic recalibration can leave your existing uh, values, preference architecture essentially intact, unless that is, you are opposed in principle to having a, a higher hedonic set point. Um, but got to be careful here because, um, yeah, in some sense, being blissfully happy, enjoying life based on gradients of bliss and in future gradients of superhuman bliss yeah consciousness uh, will be unimaginably transformed but in a in, in a good uh, in, in, in a good way i mean think of your most wonderful peak experiences imagine if life could be like that only the time all the time only better well this is shortly going to be technically possible mm -hmm. But uh, would the goal here be to apply these modifications to all humans or, for example, if people who like life as it is and the, the ones that are innately predisposed toward, posi toward positive experiences, I mean, if they, if they would opt out of these, would that be a problem? From an ethical perspective, as I said, I think... Uh, overriding obligation is to minimize suffering and if today's extreme hedonic outliers uh, i often quote anders sandberg fellow transhumanist i do have a ridiculously high hedonic set point i don't see any great ethical problem of the happiest people opting out but nonetheless this is not what i predict uh in spite being a, a negative utilitarian, I think essentially as we gain mastery over our reward circuitry, we're not going to uh, settle simply for getting rid of all experience below hedonic zero. I think future civilizations will be conducted on a much higher uh, hedonic plane. Uh, and that, yeah, if, if one has a choice between creating a civilization of plus 10 to plus 20 or plus 90 to a plus 100, why not go for the, you know, the, the absolute, absolute maximum? And I say by maximum, I'm, if, if schematically maximum, let's say, is, is plus 100, but that would be inconsistent with critical insight and, you know, advanced Civil, any kind of complex structures, but uh, yeah, actually having hedonic gradients in a, in a world where everyone is orders of magnitude happier uh, than uh, anyone has ever experienced in history, uh, it's, it's my 
cautious, tentative prediction. I don't think it's it's morally urgent, but yeah, I suspect it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So you've already mentioned several times here on the show anti-natalism, but do you think that, for example, people who would decide to opt out of these modifications if they reproduce, that they should have an ethical obligation to consider the possibility that they would be producing new people that wouldn't uh, experience this sort of uh, higher le higher levels of life satisfaction or reduced suffering? Um, as a negative utilitarian, yeah, I, I very much understand the perspective of antinatalism. I don't personally consider it ethically justifiable to conduct genetic experiments and bring new life and suffering into the world. In a world where, uh, yeah, all life is genetically guaranteed to be blissful, by all means, create, uh, create new life and uh, it, 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 it will be wonderful. I don't think there is a, an obligation to do so, but nonetheless, natalism will eventually be harmless. But that's a long way into the future. Um, I would stress again, though, that uh, I don't consider hard antinatalism, extinctionist antinatalism in the vein of someone like David Benatar, better never to have been, to be a viable solution to the problem of suffering. That there is always going to be selection pressure against antinatalism. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's I. It's difficult. I mean, I'll be honest. I I think of uh, Darwinian life. Uh, life as it is today is truly monstrous, and yeah. So I have a great deal of of, of sympathy with hard antinatalists. But any solution to the problem of suffering, it's technical feasibility is is not enough it's got to be sociologically viable and the future belongs to life lovers fanatic fanatical life lovers and uh, therefore most of my focus is on the biohappiness revolution rather than than antinatalism mm -hmm. would you say that your approach is any is in any way buddhist because i mean eliminating suffering at least seems to mm -hmm. uh, to be buddhist in a way Yes, I mean, one way to define, you know, rather than using terms like lexical negative utilitarianism is just to describe oneself as a secular Buddhist. Uh, you know, Buddha, Buddha it's, you know, I, I teach one thing, suffering and the end of suffering. May all that have life be delivered from uh, suffering. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's Buddhism updated for an era of, of biotechnology. Complications. Uh, if you call yourself a secular Buddhist, you can be sure someone will say, a Buddhist will say, ah, you haven't understood the true meaning of Buddhism. Um, also, Buddhists locate suffering, or at least most suffering, or equate it with desire. Um, and I don't think, strictly speaking, this is the case, that the happiest people today often have the most desires. And if you extinguish all desire, and if, if you look at tragically people with chronic melancholic depression, essentially nothing interests or excites them. And that other things being equal, raising people's hedonic tone, hedonic set points, creates new desires. The happiest people today tend to have the, you know, the biggest appetites. They, they engage in more forms of exploratory behavior. Uh, so, yeah, there are both uh, affinities and differences with traditional Buddhism. But at the risk of being rather fanciful, if Gautama Buddha uh, were reborn today, would he reproach advocates of biological genetic intervention, biohappiness revolution? Would he reproach us for not following the noble eightfold path? Um, I'm skeptical. The, the historical Gautama Buddha seems to have been a pragmatist. If it works, do it. And I think he would embrace the new uh, technologies with, with with open arms. Yeah. Do you think that levels of suffering have been reduced 
throughout history because that's something that some people argue. They say that if we look back uh, into history that we find that across time, uh, I mean, there are some forms of suffering that have been progressively eliminated. Do you agree with that? Yes, but not as much as one would wish. Uh, because, yeah, the hedonic treadmill still grinds as much to say as it did in the ancestral environment. Um, but yeah, some forms of suffering no longer uh, exist. No one suffers the horrors of smallpox, for example. And this is, this is clearly progress. Um, but uh, yeah, if you look at something like uh, the incidents of you know, kind of uh, divorce, uh, relationship breakups, clinical depression, suicide, self-harm. In some ways, at least, many traditional societies, uh, subjective well-being seems to be at least as good or as bad as it is in, in rich societies today. Um, so having said that, Losing, you know, losing one's uh, child, uh, infant mortality is traumatic, you know, regardless of where your default hedonic set point li lies. And so clearly, yeah, in some ways, at least life is much, much better than it was on the African savannah. But in other ways, uh, yep, not much difference. Uh, still uh, sort of jealousy. Uh, depression, uh, anxiety disorders, status anxiety, a whole raft of forms of psychological and physical distress. What are the kinds of indicators you think you, we should take into account when we want to determine if there's more or less suffering in the world? Well, I mean, at the moment, something like 850,000 people each year take their own lives and perhaps 10 times that number attempt suicide and far greater numbers of people uh, self-harm. And so if one is looking at strictly objective criteria, essentially, yeah, uh, we want to see these numbers reduced. Um, other uh, criteria yeah i mean something like asking people whether they are sad or happy a lot of people will give interviewers the kinds of answers they like uh, to, to, to hear but if one tries to quantify this if instead of asking whether you are sad happy or very happy you ask people uh where on a scale of minus 10 to zero to plus 10 where do you where do you lie? I think it's possible to improve our tools of uh, uh, measurement. Um, but yeah, there are gross and complete, well, almost uh, uh, entirely objective criteria we can we can use. Uh, and yeah, uh, something like incidents of suicide and self harm would be an example. Mm -hmm. And would there be any, for example? biomarkers or biological indicators that are more objectively uh, that are more objective in terms of determining the levels of suffering um yeah in, in the sense of uh, you know one can look at uh, kind of absenteeism sickness days uh, one can, uh, yeah, look at how the kind of the pharmacological, the genetic evidence, where, and to what extent does this converge with people's self-reports? Uh, and there does seem to be a very high uh, uh, concordance be uh, uh, between them. Um, one can, yeah, in the case of uh, of, of of people who aren't verbally competent or non-human animals, one uh, objective way to gauge happiness or suffering is to operationalize it. One can see how hard non-human animal will work to obtain or avoid a particular stimuli. Uh, one can look for signs of a lack of uh, learned helplessness and behavioral despair. These are 
uh, signs that are associated with low mood and depression. Um, yeah, so uh, just one last question. Uh, would you also care about potential new sentient beings, like, for example, advanced uh, AI systems and things like that? Um, I'm personally a skeptic about digital sentience. Uh, a lot of futurists, including many transhumanists, believe that programmable digital computers are sooner or later going to wake up and become subjects of experience. And if this is the case, then one will need to consider their interests and well-being. However, I don't think that classical digital computers can solve the binding problem. I think phenomenal binding is non-algorithmic. Uh, imagine fancifully replacing the ones and zeros of a classical digital computer with discrete pixels of experience and then executing the code, then regardless of how complex the code or however uh, fast you execute the program, all you have, the upshot is a micro experiential zombie. Indeed, the whole revolution, AI revolution, digital computing has been marked by the progressive divorce of consciousness from in, in intelligence. I mean, look, look at something like uh, uh, a, a chess playing. A, a good, you know, a good chess player can see a board differently from an amateur. And yet, as we know, uh, 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 chess software can now outperform uh, uh, humans at chess. And uh, essentially, Deep Blue, if if magically Deep Blue were to wake up, become a subject of experience, solve the phenomenal binding problem, this would not improve uh, Deep Blue's uh, performance. Um, how is it that uh, humans and other biological robots do solve the binding problem? This is a controversial issue. I've written extensively about it. Um, but uh, nonetheless, uh, it's, it's, it's a highly controversial field. No one who uh, is sympathetic to what I've been discussing, uh, who buys into the abolitionist project, need, need take my views on uh, quantum mind and the like uh, uh, seriously. And clearly, if it were the case that silicon robots, digital computers were to, were to wake up, it would transform uh, yeah, the nature of the abolitionist project and our values. But if such a, a transformation occurs, no one has the foggiest idea how this is possible consistent with the existing laws of physics. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, by all means, explore these scenarios. But I think uh, overriding focus should be on uh, on suffering creatures uh, and that a pig or a fish or a chicken suffers whereas uh, a classical digital computer as far as I'm concerned it's not even all dark inside they don't, digital computers don't have interests they're not sentient mm -hmm. okay so Mr. Pierce just before we go where can people find your work on the internet um, my original motherload website uh, is headweb.com, H-E-D-W-E-B.com. And though the style is uh, late 20th century, I do keep the, uh, the site updated on Facebook. Uh, like so many people, I've been sucked into the world of social media. There's a hedonistic uh, imperative uh, Facebook group. Um, or indeed, uh, drop me a line, Dave, at uh, headweb.com. Uh, but, uh, uh, well, yeah, Ricardo, thank you once again for inviting me on, on your show. No, of course, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you, Ricardo. Greetings from the UK. Infinite bliss. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've been doing the channel for more than three years now. And it is thanks to people like you that it's been running for so long. And so 
If you like what I'm doing, please pay a visit to my Patreon page or to PayPal. All of the links are in the description box of the interview. And to consider making a pledge there, support the show. And otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share, share the interview, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and supporters, Karen Litzke, and Blanchett, Perga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Kessel, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Eric Alenius, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Ruth Gervoz, Bo Weingart, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, George Spinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Fergal Cusson, Yevan Bodrenko, Al Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Librand, Oslan Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Sam, uh, Mark Smith, J.W., João Weira, Tom Hamel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Miran B., Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Max Bailby, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Alan or uh, Al Orwitz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Elman, João Linares, Lida Cosmidi, Saima Afzal, my producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafinia, Kian Gilligan, Sergio Codriano, Luis Caetano, Tom Venegdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Gidi, Sardos France, and Niroban Balachandran. And my executive producers, Michelle Rugieski, Rosie James Pratt, and Matthew Lavender. Thank you for all.